Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's new show that is The Adventures of the Heart. And we're going to be talking about building wisdom through experience in the shows that are here to come. Um, because I really have felt this experience of love creates all life through its desire for experience. And you cannot have an experience without someone or something, a relationship to communicate and have experiences with. So today, we are going to be uh -oh. about... Sophia, the mysteries of the heart. So hold on one second. We're having a little technical difficulties. I'm going to make some adjustments here. So one of your screens is the event page where the video is playing. If you just want to pause the video, that will stop. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm not finding that. Today, we are going to be about... Okay, you know what? It was me. <laughs> Here we go. Hello, everybody. And so that the me, we have myself, Cynthia Gardner O'Neill, and we also have joining me, my co-host, is V. Lynn Hawkins. So, Lynn, would you like to introduce yourself here for a moment? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today in our new web TV show called The Adventures of the Heart, Building Wisdom Through Experience. This has really been an amazing opportunity for me and an amazing journey because I have always considered myself to be a spiritual person, and I know that heart interaction is part of what spiritual is but I have learned so much about the heart connection and the heart as it relates to who we are and I am understanding so much more about the heart experience now so I would love to welcome you thank you for joining us and Cynthia and I are so excited to be here with you and thanks Cynthia um, just a little bit about me. I am the uh, founder and creator of the Biz Info Zone show, web TV show, and I'm the founder and dean of the P3 Academy of Social Entrepreneurship. And if you know anything about social entrepreneurship, you know that it's a heart thing when you want to do more business to do more good in the world. And that's what I'm all about. And the heart experience that I talked about that was my own is also the reason that I am doing the business of building more social entrepreneurs. And with the success statistics and failure statistics around small business, I really believe that becoming more in the social entrepreneurship and the social enterprise framework is going to be what helps small businesses to succeed. So thanks, Cynthia. I'm so happy to be here with you, girl. Well, I am excited that we decided to do this together because, you know, it is about us sharing an experience. And this experience is what we have felt in our hearts that we are here to do. And um, now I'm Cynthia Gardner O'Neill. Um, I am the founder of the Center for Loving Consciousness, where I am um, bringing together heart-centered communities to help in creating a more well um, society and communities and families and bringing love loving consciousness back into um, our world and, and just really helping you understand what the heart is about. And I have developed some programs around called Heart Monics. And today we're going to be talking about the mysteries of the heart. And um, which you're going to hear me talking about the harmonics of the heart and how they have everything to do with how uh, we experience life within our hearts. So today, warning, we're going to 
have some huge um, experiences here. All right. So the mysteries of the heart revealed today. And have you ever wondered about mysteries of the heart? Have you ever felt something right in your heart, or you've had a connection with a loved one, or um, you know, even you might not be there in the physical experience with them, but you feel them. And so this new web TV show will take you on an adventure into the heart to explore these mysteries. Now, we're going to be talking about you know, three um, different mysteries. And um, the, the last one we're going to be talking about is the heart transplant patient who solved a murder mystery. And we're going to save that one for a little bit later, because by the time we get there, you're going to understand how and why that happened. Now, uh, the other one is um, the heart takes a woman to her dream home. And that's actually an experience that Lynn is going to share with you. And then I'm going to uh, share my experience with, um, you know, when my father died and how I reconnected him with him through my heart. And the reason why I study the heart and do all this research and all this training and education is because of my experience with my own heart and what it has told me, how it has divinely guided me, and that sacred heart, that uh, the divine um, energy of how we are connected with that loving energy, that loving consciousness to all things. You know, it is the um, it is the multi-universal language of life. And in fact, the heart itself, the, the, um, the symbol of the heart, is the, a, a multi-universal, or I'll say a universal symbol that everybody recognizes as the heart, the love. So let's get started here. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Lynn because She's going to explain a little bit about her experience and, you know, about what she felt and why she is feeling that it has, what, you know, what the feeling has to do with her heart. And then, um, actually, you know what, I'm going to take a moment here to explain a couple things about the heart. Before I do that, Lynn, what do you think about that? I was actually just going to ask you to do that before I got into my story. Because I think, you know, one of the things that is so great about the Adventures of the Heart is um, the statistics around the heart, heart disease, life. Heart is life. And for us to actually focus on this subject matter, especially where it relates to business, you know, it just brings another dimension into the environment of business. So go ahead and share what you were going to say about the statistical side of things and the scientific side of things. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring up what you just said because this is really important and why also we're talking about the heart and heart monics and, and the mysteries of it is because do you know that heart disease is the number one killer disease of men and women. Women, though, are on the high end of that. More women die from heart disease than men. And then um, also about 80 million, over 80 million people are living with heart disease. In fact, both you know deaths from heart disease and the amount of people who are living with heart disease is, is far beyond the numbers of everyone who, if you totaled all your the eight people with AIDS and with cancers, all the different cancers, it still doesn't add up to the amount of people who have died from heart disease or live with heart disease. Now, then, through my research, you know what I found out? Here we have heart disease, the number one killer of humanity, the number one disease that we're living with, and we have all these fundraisers out there, all these places that you know you donate your money to that takes care of everything. And you know what? The number one um, disease that we raise money for is, is cancer. And cancer raises over $264 million a year. 
for cancer. Now, heart disease, cancer is um, it's number two behind um, heart disease, but on the scale of the amount of money that is raised for heart disease, it rates third in the money raised for heart disease, which is only around, I think it was around 96 million. So $264 million are raised for cancer and only 96 million, 94, 96 million are, are raised for heart disease. Um, little problem there for me because also I know that the heart is the central communication center for every single one of your cells. Every single one of your cells. The heart cell is the first cell, the embryonic heart cell, first cell upon your conception. And it's what gets, you know, other cells, you know, so you get a muscle cell because you need those to get the heart pumping, but they're still in the group of the heart. They're still heart cells in order for the heart to work and pump. So, and that heartbeat is the signature sound of you. Every experience that ever was a part of who you are is a, a sound that is coming in and being created, sound creates form. And in one of my other shows, we're going to talk about sound and how our voice has a lot to do with telling about the state of our health. I'm a bioacoustic and energy informatic research scientist. I've done lots of research about, around energies and frequencies, and you're going to hear a lot about that because harmonics, the harmonics of the heart, heartmonics, what I teach, has a lot to do with this kind of science. And um, so when I'm speaking of the heart communicating with every single cell, that includes, you know, you've got brain cells, right? And everybody talks about the brain being the kind of the central communicator. But really, it's the heart, and everything begins in the heart and then goes to the brain. And um, I also talk about brain dominance, and what does brain dominance have to do with the heart? Well, it has everything to do with it. And um, you can find out more about that on my website, too, at heartmonics.org. You know, you can go to a couple of my pages. I have some information on brain dominance. I also have some information on... Um, the sound of our voice and bioacoustics and what that has to do with our heart and things like that. So you can go and explore there. Also, there's a, um, information on the heart. I love learning a lot. A lot of my information, too, has come from HeartMath. And there's a wonderful, um, in one of my tabs on heartmonics.org, you'll see heart. And you can go there and watch a movie about the heart's intelligence that HeartMath made. So to show you how the heart amplifies, it's 60 times more amplified than any part of your body. And it's 5,000 times more electromagnetic. Electromagnetic. And so what we put out is going out into the world and we get back 100 times plus that we bring back to ourselves. So again, I'm going to go back to what we just started with. You know, the number one killer disease of humanity is heart disease. And I truly believe the more we become aware of this, the more knowledge that we gain, and that's what we're sharing with you, the more understanding we will have and the more acceptance we will have for ourselves and for one another. And that leads us to that loving consciousness. So those are my five levels of heartmonics, okay? It's awareness. And I want to let our audience know, too, that you will yep. see how we explore those five levels of heartmonics. You will see how we explore the relationship of the heart in a lot of things, business, in relationships, in your physical self, your physical being. I mean, we just talked about some of the statistics there. You'll hear us over the course of time on this show talk about the spiritual. And I don't mean the religious. I truly mean the spiritual that you can't do from the brain side. And if you do, then we're going to help you to recognize how much your heart plays into that. And it amazes me how Cynthia talked about the amplification 
that our heart sends out a beat that is amplified so many times because it is an electromagnetic pulse but 100 times what she didn't mention is the resonance the sound that comes back to us and we're going to explore all of that it sounds you know like way scientific I love that and it also can sound kind of woo woo. We were talking about the woman <laughs> who um, had a heart transplant, and you know that's when you're getting into the yeah right. You know, is this Ripley's believe it or not or what? Well, and it will be based in science. Yeah, we're actually going to explore this and more as we explore the mysteries of the heart. You know, Cynthia started out telling you that uh, part of my story was how I was led to the home of my dreams. And I have to tell you that I've always been a spiritual person. I've always had this heart connection to God because I believe the one, one of the reasons is that my, my dad died when I was seven. And my mom raised four kids, single parent. I was the oldest girl. And I went through some stuff as the oldest girl. Um, didn't have a childhood. I actually ended up being my mother's wife. And my mom was really hurt by my dad leaving so early. And, you know, I became the object that she was able to take out her anger and frustration on. And what I realized as an adult was that actually I was put there with the heart that I have to be able to take that so that she still could go on and do the work that she was called to do. She was actually an amazing influence, a minister, one of the first three black female ministers in the Presbyterian, ordained in the Presbyterian ministry. And I look at some of the things that she did and I know that part of who I am and what it is that I do is because of that. I look at my father, he was the hawk symbol, he was the strength and the soaring and the flying, yet for me, I had to learn who I was. I was born in the month of July, so I grew up thinking Leo the Lion. I had to actually exert as Leo the Lion in order to, you know, not become more of a doormat and to really make my way in life. I ended up at a young age being a single parent of two kids with no support. My, their father, his family did very little, if anything, my family did very little. My mom was an only child, so I didn't even have a lot of family. And, you know, it, it took me on a journey that has actually helped me to understand more about who it is that I am today. Uh, how it is and when it is the lioness in me comes out versus the hawk in me. And the hawk is the side of me that has migrated. And can you see the lion and the hawk traveling together? That is such a beautiful scene to me. And I've seen it in my mind's eye, didn't understand it. But what I did understand was the angelic realm. And I knew that my heart was connected in the angelic realm. And I got a job. I was given three days to go to the new location in Columbus, Ohio. To Actually, it happened twice. Once in Columbus, Ohio, and once in Northern Virginia. And it was um, something that I actually said couldn't happen. Yet it did, and it did happen because I needed to be proved wrong in the aspect that my heart couldn't lead me to the answer, and I needed to be proven right that my heart could lead me to the answer. And so I'm in this unfamiliar territory, and it's the nth hour. I'm with the real estate broker. We have looked at probably eight houses and none of them were the houses that I felt were calling me, that I was connected to. And fortunately, she had sent me the listings prior to coming up 
and being with her that day. I had one day and I had picked out the things that I thought looked good. We talked about them. For some reason, she did not go to the one that was the first one that I had asked about. And so we're finishing up the day, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just not satisfied. Something is not right. And then my heart spoke to me. I heard spirit speak through my heart to say, the one that you thought about, ask about. And I did. We went by and looked at it. And when I saw it from the outside, I knew that that was the house. Now, then we get into the aspect of it was right at the upper edge cusp of what it was that I had been pre-approved for and a little bit over so I had to go back to the, the loan side and see if I could get approved and rates when you know it their rates had just dropped a little bit that got me qualified for that dollar amount of house and my family and I lived in that house for almost three years and I tell you we had nothing but beautiful loving experiences growth experiences and I know that was because I had it on my heart I had set the intention and had it on my heart to find the right home for my family and it happened and that that's that story there's so many more and over the course of time we'll be exploring them and and seeing that happen but think about it can you think of anything in your lifetime that has happened to you that feels very similar? Your heart was involved. Wouldn't you say, Cynthia? Absolutely. And, um, boy, the, a lot of this information I'm going to be sharing, you're going to understand why she had that experience. Because there's something about her heart, the resonance of the heart, which she was amplifying out, that there was something that harmonically resonated with what she was putting out she was receiving that same frequency that coherency that actually brought her to her heart's desire and you know that house whatever was a part of the um, energy that was a part of that house had also put out that frequency to bring you so um, and what I'm saying here, you might be going, nah, I don't know, I don't get that. But by the time we're done here, I'm going to share some really incredible research and um, uh, experiments and things like that that were done that is really going to shine on the mystery of what brought her heart to that house or the house to you, Lynn. Bringing my heart to that house, yeah. yeah. Bringing the house to my heart, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It, it is so, a resonant um, frequency. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and um, how, you know, why we're here. And my heart is absolutely what has brought us here together. And um, why I'm here speaking about loving consciousness and harmonics and the mystery of the heart, taking you guys on an adventure into your heart, and so that you can also apply it to your communities, your families, your business, and all those things. And um, we want to really connect with you. We want to connect with you as maybe a parent, a leader of your community, or anybody who really wants to step up and change some of this consciousness. Change some of our DNA. And I'm going to teach you a little bit about all that because the heart can transform your DNA, love itself, and it definitely transforms consciousness. So with myself, uh, my life starts out uh, where my story starts out where my father died when I was seven. And upon his death, you know, at seven years old, Really, we don't know. I mean, I didn't know what grief was. And um, I actually had still continued to have an experience with my father, even after he died. Is like he was right here. I mean, I had experiences with him. It wasn't in this physical realm, as we would say you could only have a physical experience with someone. It was an experience of the heart. And 
he would come to me all the time. I just had a whole different relationship with him than you would here on earth. Well, as I expressed that when I was a kid, I had so many people say, poor girl, she's having fantasies and, you know, you know, she's not going to get over her father and uh, who knows what's going to happen to her. But, you know, I, I also started having experiences with other people who transitioned, too. And um, so I was called a liar a lot of times that, that, you know, no one believes you. Why are you lying like this? So I really shut down after a while. But then my mother remarried a man who, um, he, he abused my whole family, my mom, my sister, my brother, and myself. But I was raped and sexually abused and beaten many times throughout my life of uh, four years, five, five years, till I was like 15, 16 years old. And um, during that time, I actually was ill. I, at a short time, I was paralyzed. I had left my body. I went to my father. Um, I left this realm. And um, even though I was existing here in the physical, I actually um, kind of disconnected from my body. So what happened there was it was I was my heart was connected. And um, so when I was in an abusive place, my illness was my way to protect myself because I wasn't abused when I was ill and especially when I was paralyzed and things like that. But um, what got me through those years of abuse and rape and everything was actually my connection with love, with my father. I went there. You know, what can I do? I can still have a relationship with my dad. And he was what helped me when I left that gave me the courage and to leave this experience at the age of 16 and because I knew love was there I was never alone I was never without that um, loving consciousness you know it was a hard difficult time believe me it was it was uh, pretty horrific some of the things I went through and probably to this day, I really haven't talked very much about it. And uh, maybe some of that will come out just so I can maybe help someone else who's had the experiences I have. But again, that's what brought me to be here, to speak to you all about the heart. And, you know, my um, experience was that this world is of loving consciousness. And so uh, from there... I've gone out into the world and thought, you know, why am I having these experiences and other people don't? And so that took me on my journey, my adventure into my heart to discover who I am and how I can make a difference in other people's lives. And through that, I have studied, um, really gotten into understanding what frequencies are, you know, what energy is, what love is all those kind of things and um, I've studied um, I have a major in alternative medicine I um, studied bioacoustics which is the bio frequency or the bio um, sounds of the body and um, also energy informatics thought field therapy um, uh, energy medicine all kinds of things and so Today, I'm going to share some really interesting research that was done and take us into that whole mystery of the heart and our cells and how we communicate with one another. So with that story of myself about you know, how I connected with my heart, you might ask, how did you do that? How do you connect with your heart? you know, to someone who's transitioned into, you know, who isn't here on this plane anymore. Well, how I understand it is because, and I get information from working with um, patients who come to me that are referred to me who are, have been in pain for a long time. And I had two specific uh, women who came to me who were having painful experiences because uh, of a loved one passing on. Well, these both were really profound to me, understanding our experiences 
with one another and our heart. And I'm going to share these both with you so you know what I'm speaking about and then I'm going to share the science of this with you. And just to support this also, there is a book that I recommend to many people. It is called um, Proof of Heaven. And it was written by a neuroscientist, uh, a neurosurgeon, who actually, um, he was renowned and really respected in neuroscience and everything. And he ended up in a coma for seven days. And he had an experience where he left his body and had an experience with his heart and with love and, um, and then came back. And he truly, and he wrote a book, and he brings in all the science because he believes that he was chosen to be in this position to write this book to teach people how we connect with our hearts and the, why, you know, what makes a difference, you know, how it doesn't make that difference that we can continue relationships with people who have transitioned. And he believes he was chosen because he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in all the stuff. People would come, you know, that he, his patients that he would work with would talk to him about their emotions and what they were feeling and that they saw this light or they had this experience with someone who would transition or they, you know, came back from the dead, <laughs> you know, and uh, he would just say, oh, that has nothing, you know, that's, you know, just what you're experiencing inside of you and your in your body, it does. It's not anything more than that. But he found out otherwise, and no one could understand why he ended up in this coma. Um, they showed that he had spinal meningitis, and there was just no way that he could have contracted that or anything. And then being in a coma for seven days changed everything. You know, I mean, they didn't think he would be able to come out and even be able to be coherent and, and, and write about it, let alone, you know, go around and have these experiences that what, and, and teach this to everyone. So that's a book I highly recommend to people to understand this a little bit more. And he talks all about the heart. And um, so uh, I'm going to tell you about two of these uh, people that I had experiences with and one was a young woman she was 23 years old and when I was working with her I'm a massage therapist also and um, an intuitive healer and I was working with her and her her sister came in and and there's ways for me to um, make sure that we understand that information that uh, we validate it and what happens is I have an experience, my heart being an empath or clairsentient, my heart actually connects with the energy of someone else's heart. And I have an experience. It might not be uh, our five senses in the physical, but it's an experience and then it's translated into the physical. So with this woman, at the end of our session together, um, she asked, you know, her sister had died three years prior. She was 17 years old and she had died in a car accident. And um, my client says to me, ask her why she left us. I want to know why she left us. How could she leave us like this? And what the experience I had was, we don't leave you. You leave us because your consciousness doesn't allow you to have a relationship with us in a way that you can have because we've been taught otherwise and so when we decide um, when someone passes on that they're gone and we feel alone and we feel lost and we're never going to see them again really they're living on through our hearts and, and are connected with our hearts but we disconnect from them because we don't real recognize that we can have that relationship still because we've been told that we can't. And then the second one, which was in the same day, um, I work with a chiropractor and um, he sends me people who have had difficulties with their pain far too long than they should be in pain. And so he um, asked me if I would um, see the, his patient and I said, absolutely, I will. As she came in, um, I noticed the how 
the, the pain and where it was in her body and everything and I asked her some questions because it was a uh, very masculine energy that I was feeling and uh, then she started she broke down and she started crying and um, all of a sudden her father came through and the thing is is he he said what came up for that because she told me she said oh my gosh you know my father uh, he passed away two years ago and I have had this pain and it gets worse every time it's around his birthday and when it's around um, the holidays and things like that I was my father's daughter I was you know we were best friends and I just am having a difficult time being without him I'm in so much pain and so when he came through he said my dear my darling please don't let me be the reason for your pain you know, no one wants to be the reason for someone they love's pain. Please set me free so you can, you know, live your life more easily and happily and in a place of love. And I can too, and we can connect then. We don't have to be separated, but what was separating them was the pain, mm -hmm. was, was the um, lower consciousness energy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all her pain went away. She was like, oh my gosh, I never thought of that it that way. You know, she was creating the pain. And also, he was feeling her pain. And so I'm saying feeling her pain. Because here's the last question. So we, we started laughing and just the pain went away and just being in this joyous place of this connection. And the next thing I know, she says to me, oh my god. Can my father see me naked? Can my father see me having sex? And what came through me was, and we laughed, you know, and what came through me is, no, they're not here in the physical. They don't, they don't have the same experiences that we have. They're all energy. And so, but they feel us. They feel our pain. They, they feel our joy. They feel our pleasure. You know, they're not seeing it in our five senses like we do and have that experience. But they do feel when you are hurting. They do feel when you are loving. And when you're in those higher consciousness of love, that's when you can, you can go to a higher consciousness and connect with them. And so I just wanted to add that in because this is really important. I really need to share this with you. And it is because of our heart, that amplification that's going out and coming in. Now, we can only measure that 60. We only have the measurement to measure that 60 times more amplification than any parts of our body and or 5,000 times more electromagnetic, you know, the electromagnetic field and how far it goes. We don't have the way to measure. I mean, today we're measuring the immeasurable. You know, things that we could not measure a few years yeah. back, we are measuring today. And we will right. continue to move in that motion because we maybe experience only 1% of what is in this world. Only 1%. There's 99% of unbelievable adventures and mysteries out yes. there for us to discover. Yeah. Yes, and I just want to bring up to add to that, you know, there is mystery, but there are answers too. And what we will be exploring over the next however long, <laughs> and it's going to be a long time because there is so much to explore, is the mysteries and what happens to the mysteries to bring them to a level and a place of being able to understand them. Now, you know, I do believe that there are some things that are just unexplainable. And one of the things that I have come to grips with is that when your heart is in a place of acceptance, of that which you do not understand nor see a way of understanding your heart can open to an aligned space where if there is an answer it will come 
if there isn't an answer, an understanding around that will also show up. And there's so many mysteries of the heart. Uh, one of which is, you know, we talked about the dis-ease and the uh, sickness that people are in. Yep. And there are some healing centers that people can go to who've been diagnosed with terminal cancer where they come out and they are completely cured. They're healed. And one of the things that I have learned is that there has been some real work around the heart and being in the heart of things that we typically understand, the heart of forgiveness, the heart of seeing beyond the illusion of what we perceive a situation might be, to really being able to ask the question so that we can get the feedback to help us understand what really happened. And that's, that's some of the mystery that we're going to talk about. But Cynthia, tell our audience a little bit about some of the people that we've already got lined up that we're going to be bringing into the community to <laughs> explore some of these mysteries with. Well, we are going to have the Tall Trees, um, Terry and Chief Tall Tree come in, and they're going to be talking about the mysteries of heart, and they're going to be talking about some of the ancient wisdom, uh, the Native American wisdom of the heart, and that's going to be really fascinating. I'm really looking forward to that. And then we uh, next week, uh, next Thursday, we have Matt Perlstein of New Directions. He talks. He gets into. Um, he's the EQ dude. He's the guy who is about. Um, emotional intelligence, and you're going to hear some from some of the science I'm going to be sharing you, uh, with you about the emotions, and but he's going to really bring in some incredible information about emotional intelligence, and um, oh gosh, uh, Mrs. Cardiology, yeah, Mrs. Card, yes, Sania, yeah. Mrs. Yeah. Cardiology, and who else? I mean, uh, help me out because uh, uh, I couldn't think of. We have, we uh, let's just put it this way. You've heard about some of the people that we have lined up that are coming in. And join us, watch the replay, however you can plug into this. We want you to plug into it because you are going to learn so much about how the heart communicates with the world outside of us and how the heart communicates with the person who we are. From within. Yes, yes. Yes, and it's going to be an amazing journey. We want you to be a part because there is so much to explore. And we're going to look at things from the standpoint of leadership. Leaders in the communities, leaders in business, leaders in um, corporate environment, leaders who will really be able to understand this information just like you understand a personality assessment and you can go into wherever the groups are that you are leaders in and you can be the example, you can be the information bearer into those groups about what you've come to understand and our desire, our intention is to be the resource for you to have that information for you to be able to go out into the world and impact others there. Cynthia and I are both really in the space of being difference makers because we've, we've seen our own pain, we've walked out of our own pain, we continue to grow and at this juncture with what each of us has learned and it, our teaching right now, it's, it's acutely, it's made us acutely aware of how important this subject matter is. And <laughs> To know that there have been people who've healed from cancer. Cynthia tells the story of one of her friends. She's a wilderness outfitter. And one of her friends that was, you know, a, a health nut, a sports and fitness nut who contracted cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy and would come to visit Cynthia on the weekends after her therapy in order to be out in nature and what it did to her 
physical recovery, what it did to her spiritual recovery, and what it did to her life as a whole, her relationship with her husband, her family, her friends. Um, what we're doing, what we're bringing to you is really the work that Cynthia does and the work that I do from a business standpoint. And both of us are so aligned in the harmonize your business, harmonize your life. That's how come we are here. That's what we want to share with you. That's what we want to make certain that you have a good understanding of this information because we do want you to take it with you to friends and family and others that you know and we'd like for you to invite them into our community. We're going to be posting information about the upcoming show so you'll be able to see what's coming up and you know let your friends know. This is something that we're doing as um, our difference maker initiative. Well, it's our it's our heart's desire to yes. to make a difference in this world, in communities, and families, and in business. Just like we we you know we're starting out to let you know that this information we're giving you will change your whole experience with life, your consciousness, and your DNA. It absolutely will. And right now, I can I'm gonna. Go ahead and share this um, next story um, with everybody, and um, and it's about also helping you stay youthful, and um, you know help you adapt and change with ease even during difficult times. And so I've been research I've been researching what it is that keeps all things youthful, youthful and vibrant and healthy, whole and complete, and the answer is love kindness and compassion for all things. Now this is so important for our communities. So science has been determ has determined that the healing powers of compassion can add years of quality living to your life. Now the Tibetan monks that were incarcerated, beaten, and tortured by the Chinese are living very youthful, healthy, vibrant lives into years beyond anyone would think after having experienced major physical trauma. However, these monks are still making stem cells that rejuvenate their bodies. Why, you may ask? Well, here's the answer. Dalai Lama asked one of the monks what was the most difficult thing he, they faced during this time of abuse. The monk replied, my biggest fear was that I would lose compassion for my enemies. I want you to breathe that in. My biggest fear was that I would lose compassion for my enemies. Now we heal through our compassion for our enemies. Heal our world and have compassion for all things, for everything has consciousness. You know, create heaven on earth and love thy neighbor as thyself. Love activate your stem cells. And I have a lot more to say about that here. And your DNA. You know, as we, become, as we begin to uh, become more self-aware, we learn more about ourself. And I happen to call self, my acronym for self, S-E-L-F, is the source energy love frequency. That's your heartbeat your source energy love frequency, which is your own enlightened inner pharmacy. So love is the medicine of the earth. It is our heart that leads us to our soul, our true self. So life is eternal through our hearts. And what do you have to say to that, my dear Lynn? You know, I was <laughs> going to ask you, Especially when you were talking about um, feeling the compassion for others and helping to heal the world. You know, it occurred to me that many of us desire to do that and are quick to also understand how do I do that. Um, 
and even think, how can I have compassion for others when I am in this space of, you know, this is happening and that's happening, or I don't feel good about myself. I, I don't feel deserving of even giving my own self the kind of compassion that I either do give to others or desire to give to others. And that's key to me because I think that allows us to see the beginning of dis-ease. When a person understands that they are in dis-ease, the first thing that I always ask is, what's the underlying reason? Because people always want to point out, well, I fell. Well, they did this, or that happened, or, you know, but it, it wasn't about, I didn't take care of myself. I haven't slept well in the last couple of weeks, and so as I was walking, I fell. Or, you know, something of that nature. And it truly is that we have to direct things to ourselves first. Um, Louise Hay talks about, in order to help heal others, let it begin with you. Heal yeah. yourself first. And, you know, you hear it all the time if you've ever flown on an airplane. If the oxygen mask falls, put yours on first, and then you can help others. It's the same thing. Absolutely. Really appreciate your acronym on self because, you know, and not in a narcissistic way, right? It's in a way that no. you have to take care of yourself and feel worthy of claiming yourself first. I know, especially for women, we've always we've been taught and it's easy for us to say, I'm going to take a back seat to the kids and I'm going to take a back seat to take care of family and I don't matter in a lot of these instances when actually if you're the caregiver, if you're the one that's taking care of the family, if you're the one that's taking care of anyone or anything around you, you have to take care of yourself. It's your responsibility to take care of yourself first. Yes. And that's one of the things that we'll be exploring too because when our heart feels we're taking care of ourselves, our heart is much more willing to take care of others. Hmm. Would you agree? Oh, yes. Um, you know, there's just so much to be said for that because you ha what you feel in your heart, your state of being, let it be love. If yeah. it's not, you're putting out, you're putting, you're amplifying a frequency. Like, uh, let's say you're angry with the world, or you don't trust the world. If you don't trust the world, you're amplifying that you don't trust. And guess what? You're gonna get, you're gonna bring back to you people who don't trust you, because you don't trust them. Well, they don't trust you. So you don't create the. You're gonna find coherency, but it's gonna be coherency with what's in your heart, what you're feeling. And that's a choice, by the way. And a lot of people have a hard time recognizing their responsibility to what they're feeling. And no feeling, no healing. So what I'm not I'm saying is not, you know, not to you know, don't feel. What I'm saying is to feel. Because what's happened to society today is we've been desensitized to not feel, especially men. And really what that does is it takes your power away. You don't have more power by trying to control life. In fact, controlling life actually shuts down your, your heart. It hardens your heart. It creates heart disease. What controlling, I always say, stop trying to control life and start living it. Mm -hmm. This is so powerful. So feeling, no feeling, no healing. We have to feel it. We have to become aware of what we are feeling in order to really get into our hearts, to start feeling, because your hearts are so much wiser than your brains, number one. So get out of your head and into your heart, because your heart is so much wiser than your brain. And your, you know, your brain actually uh, is really physically connected 
to the physical. Your heart, though, is what is connected to all things, the all, all right, to everything. And a lot of times I, you know, being empathic or clear ascension, I can tell way before, like, um, my partner, when he would come home with the horses, you know, the, the hardest thing sometimes is to stop the trailer with the horses and open a gate, you know, and, and the horses are, you know, it's just you would rather just come right on in the gate. But sometimes we had to close the gate because, you know, I'd have some of the hor other horses in the, in the yard and stuff like that. But I would always know when he was coming home without him even calling me or anything. And I would go out, open the gate, and next thing you know, he'd come driving in just minutes after I've opened the gate. Now, Rupert Sheldrake, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him, he did um, a study on morphic resonance. And it was about, you know, you might even hear about studies that was called the 100th monkey. Um, and, but he did this study about with dogs, where they, dog owners, they put um, these video camcorders uh, in, the, um, in the home. And what they did is they, they checked out to see how the dog reacted while the his um, owner or uh, the, the people who were away, his family was away. And um, what they found is what, what they watched is the dog would get ready for the owner or the, the family to come home even before they decided to come home. Isn't that crazy? And also they found, you know, in the home, dogs, um, they feel you. They feel, you know, once they're connected with you, it is within the heart. And what's amazing um, is there was a young man who was an epileptic. And um, when he went to school, to the certain school, he had a dog that actually could... Um, take him to safety before he had a seizure. And when he brought the dog into the school, the school wouldn't allow for the dog to come into the school with him. And they were saying to him that they didn't feel that the dog was necessary because the dog, you know, the dog couldn't do anything to, to keep him from having an, a seizure. And the issue was they had to end up, they ended up going to court to make sure the dog could be with him because what the dog did it could tell minutes you know quite a while before he had the seizure and take him to safety where he could have the seizure yeah he could have the seizure and he wouldn't put himself in danger yes yes so um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over for you to say a little bit more to that and I see some questions coming in so I just want to just uh, check in with that. Um, okay, because I'm actually looking at the time and we're going to yes. have to wrap up soon. However, the show would not be the show that we intended to be without our audience. So I would love to thank you who... Oh, hold on. I want to, because right now we said this was going to be an hour and a half. But I have a question, um, and it was about, hey, I'm a scientist. My, I've been a scientist my whole life. I would like to hear some of the studies you mentioned. So um, can we go ahead and get into that, Lynn? Sure. Yeah, since he's asking. So I'm going to go ahead and go for these studies and also tell you about the, um, the heart, pa the, the person who got the heart transplant. So we can um, move into some of the, these studies. So first one. Okay, was about, and I talked about DNA. Can the heart transform your DNA? Well, here's a study. The following is a fascinating experiment conducted by the Institute of Heart Math. In this experiment, some human DNA was placed in a container from which they could measure subtle changes in cellular structure. 28 vials of DNA were given, one each, to 28 trained researchers. Each researcher had been trained how to generate and feel feelings, and they each had strong emotions. It was discovered that the DNA changed its shape according to the feeling of the researchers. When the researchers felt gratitude, love, and appreciation, the DNA responded by relaxing and the strands unwound. 
the strands of the DNA became longer. When the researchers felt anger, fear, frustration, or stress, the DNA responded by tightening up. The strands became stronger and switched off many of our DNA codes. If you've ever felt shut down by negative emotions, this may explain why your body was equally shut down. The shutdown of the DNA codes was reversed and the codes were switched back on again when the feelings of love, joy, gratitude, and appreciation were felt by the researchers. This experiment was later followed up by testing HIV patient, positive patients. They discovered that feelings of love, gratitude, and appreciation created 300,000 times more disease resistance than those without the positive feelings. Emotional input can go far beyond the effects of neurological signals to the body. Individuals trained in deep love were able to actually change the shape of their DNA. Essentially, this report confirms that we influence our bodies and the whole web of creation through our emotional vibrations. And this was from a paper entitled Local and Non-Local Effects of Coherent Heart Frequencies and Conformational Changes of DNA. Now this experiment gives us substantial evidence that we create our reality by choosing it with our feelings. Our feelings activate our future and integrate it with the web of creation around us. This in turn connects to all the energy and matter of the universe. Emotional and the spiritual energy can cause profound changes in human performance. This energy is woven into a web surrounding your body which connects with all matter, time and space. The center of this web on an individual level is the human heart. The heart marks the presence of an even more perfect center that many believe to be the sacred heart. In discovering the center, you are acquiring access to the command center of your life, where you will find answers to help you stay well, no matter what dreadful virus or bacteria may be floating around. By staying in feelings of joy, love, gratitude, and appreciation, your life will immeasurably improve wow. well, one which speaks to what we were talking about before how you living your life in that manner impact those around you your family it's how when your heart changes towards a situation and you're interacting with your family you're then able to see the hearts of family members change it happens the same way in business too. Now what I also heard you say was it also has the same effect on a cellular level in our own physical bodies that can in fact change DNA, right? Is that what you said? Absolutely. And I have another another study about that if you guys if you'd like me to you know talk about that also. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Well, there was a researcher, Daniel Winter, in conjunction with the Institute of Heart Math, has been mapping the electrical and sonic links between cardiac electricities, mental processes, emotions, and brain electricities. Winter is especially interested in the relationship between DNA programming and immune health. So um, Daniel Winter and the Institute of Heart Math um, they uh, did a spectrum analysis of EKG test on subjects who were um, practiced in sending out conscious love. And this is what I was just talking about, too. They made significant discoveries. So Winter states that when love was being sent to someone, the spectrum analysis of the EKF revealed a ratio between the frequency peaks of 1.618 is the most efficient ratio known for the transfer of energy between scales. When energy is phased, phase locked with this ratio, it cascades between octaves without losing momentum or memory of itself. The fractal design of the heart uses this principle to send energy cascading down the harmonic 
series to the DNA. The, G, the geometry of these waves looks exactly like the DNA as viewed from the top. Okay? The main point here is that 1.618 is also the ratio of the DNA structure and is the only ratio that allows complete information or geometry to cascade down the harmonic series without loss of power or ge uh, ge um, geometry. Loving, co loving, loving causes the coherence and ratio necessary to send energy up or down the harmonic series from the higher organizational dimensions down to the DNA. In a sense, this direction radiates to the DNA and immune system from the heart, unless there is a conscious link up to the core of one's being. By loving and caring, it is possible to reprogram and empower the DNA with the intelligence of working for the whole from the perspective of higher electrical energy dimensions. The implication of this research is very profound. By sending coherent heart frequencies of conscious love and care, people can enter into the DNA and reprogram and empower it to improve immune system and cellular health. Universal love embraces, protects, nurtures, and communicates to the DNA to unfold its blueprint. Now this communication cascades on frequency harmonics of the golden mean spiral. Aha, uh -huh. where do what we hear is that the all the time? Golden bean spiral. Oh my Only God. Only through sincere love and care from the core of the being in the heart can we enter into God's design and co create, as they call it, a holographic level of the DNA. Oh. The heart is the protective safety valve. This is very different from genetic engineering as we know it now which is only tinkering with the component of the gene on the physical level. Well, you know, we've got a question out here that actually asks, and it's right in alignment, can you speak on the heart and stem cell creation? Yes, I just saw that. Now, um, so stem cells, as we know, um, so the point, what I was talking about the Tibetan monks, and they, when they, uh, they lived, uh, the ones that were released from the trauma that weren't, you know, killed and lived through the trauma and the abuse and everything, they have gone on to live into far beyond their hundreds and they're vibrant and they're healthy. And that's why they did a study on the Tibetan monks. And they found that they were still making stem cells. Now we're told that we stop making stem cells as we get older. But really, we stop making stem cells because we put ourselves under stress. And that starts depleting um, our, our stem cells from, from being created. And, you know, that comes from the bone marrow. And so I can get really deep into this. But, you know, bone marrow is, you know, your red blood cells. And really, it's all cells. So um, everything starts with the, the heart cell but we can get a little deeper. I didn't bring the science all in to you know, completely support all that I'm saying here, but the love, just like we've shown, that, that, that changes the DNA. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. When we are in a loving state, a loving consciousness, the state of our being is love, we have a coherency in our heart that when something incoherent is coming in, a frequency, we are able to harmonize that frequency to, so it won't affect us. That's what I was saying in one of the other studies, um, that even a virus being around, like I haven't, I have not had, you know, when I get into some stressful times, I'll get maybe a little sniffle or something, but I'll be aware that I'm getting, um, I'm putting myself under stress, and I change how I'm seeing that experience. And so I haven't been to a doctor or any done anything in it's 15 years now. It was 15 years ago that I actually went to a doctor. That's it. Um, mostly, and I wouldn't. I'm not suggesting that for everybody or anything. I just know myself. I know 
when I am putting myself in a stressful situation or thinking things that are harmful for me. And I sit down with myself and I connect with my heart and I say, what would I rather have instead? And that's one of my questions in my, um, what I offer you in Heartmonics at the heartmonics.org is this question, what would you rather have instead, is so important for you transforming out of pain. So if you're in pain, I ask you, what would you rather have instead? Now most of my clients say, no pain. And I say, well, you're still focused on pain. And so what's the opposite of your pain? Well, let's find serenity. All right, great, serenity. Is serenity healthy for you? I have three powerful questions that I ask. So um, most of the time people say, yes, serenity is healthy for me. And then I say, well, what's the adverse consequence to you having serenity then? How come you don't have it? And I say, well, there isn't an adverse consequence to me having serenity. And I'll say, well, why, why don't you have it right now then? So bringing in that awareness, you know, using me as an example, so when I was a child being abused, I actually made myself sick. And it was my way of protecting myself from abuse. Now, was that healthy for me at that time? Yes, it was. Is it healthy for me today to be sick? No, absolutely not. But we have to find out why, you know, be aware and feel what's going on there. Ask yourself what you'd rather have instead, and if it's something opposite than what you have, find out why you don't have it. But the question what I'd rather have instead takes you in a forward movement into a higher frequency, okay? The heart frequency. And what you'd rather have instead, if it's serenity or peace, that's a higher frequency. So you're already in a forward movement. And guess what? It's not a lie. So many things out there, they're talking about, oh, positive thinking and stuff like that. Well, many of my clients were going, you know, Cynthia, I'm in pain. You know, I'm friggin' pain, and you're telling me to think positive? Do an affirmation? I don't want to lie to myself. I understood exactly what they were saying to me, and I, I didn't have an answer for them. But now I do, because I realize when I go to my heart, I ask myself when I'm in a discordant energy, I say, what would I rather have instead? And I go there. That's forward movement. And guess what? It takes you into your heart, and life is so much easier. Go to the love. It's the same thing that the man who had transitioned, and I was with his daughter, and she was in so much pain. You know, she, she put herself in pain so that, you know, she, she couldn't. wasn't flowing forward into the love. So she couldn't have that connection because she, she was release. in the lower. Yeah, she and couldn't her, release what she thought was her past connection for what could be a better connection with him having transition and that lack of releasing him caused her pain. I know that feeling too. I, I recall a time when I was growing up not long after my dad had passed that I, I think that was the exact same place that I was in and it caused me so much deep pain that I spent hours in tears as a little kid, seven, seven and a half, eight years old, crying, um, you know, this the whole boo hoo hoo snot and all, all that happening for hours. And I remember that it made my mother so concerned that she finally did something about it. And she brought my cousin one of my um, older cousins who um, didn't know what was going on either and she got there at a time that I was still in this space of just crying uncontrollably and asked me why I don't know I don't understand what this is all about until she started asking me questions like Lynn you have to know the reason why because I can't help you otherwise. 
And I was trying to say, well, why did my dad die? What did it mean for him to die? And then she answered that for me. And then it was like, well, what am I supposed to do now? And she answered that. She was probably only 16 years old at the time. And I remember asking her, why didn't anyone want to tell me this information before now? I remember when my dad first died, and back in those times, it was kids should not be anything um, seen and not heard, right? Don't ask any questions. Just do what I tell you. Yet, I was the kind of child that my father brought up to be very inquisitive and explorative, and I was a seeker of understanding. It was that incident that let me know I was a seeker of understanding, and it made me really go into a place of mistrust for the people who were supposed to be caring for me because I could not get the information from them. But when my cousin explained that to me, Lynn, they just didn't know how badly you needed this information. I saw my dad in the casket, and I asked the question out loud, why is daddy there sleeping? Why isn't he getting up and coming home with us? Why isn't this happening and that happening? No one could find them the, the, the I don't know what it would even, what to even call it, but no one could find the space to pull me aside and even explain a little bit. And I know that my incongruency with all of that took me to this place of pain. I didn't want to let go. I didn't understand. I didn't see that there could be something ahead that could be a better place to be. I understand holding on to the pain. And I understand how that can become our story. And you and I had this conversation about story and why people hold on to the pain of their story and looking at you ask three questions one is what would you rather have instead another is um, what's the second one um, is this healthy for me is this healthy for me and then the third one is what's the adverse uh, consequences yes and so there have been a lot of instances where, you know, thoughts like this incident with my dad, my cousin coming to my rescue, because I felt like I could resolve that now. I understood what death meant. I understood that he went to heaven. I understood the answers to the questions. Well, why didn't he get up and get, get out of the casket? Well, he couldn't. <laughs> that was just his body. And, you know, all of those things coming to light for me, are one of the things that you and I are bringing to this community. Now, there is another question up here. I've seen studies um, on how each sickness has its own frequency as well as health being a higher vibration. When one's vibration dips, what are the methods that you can use to address raising that vibration? to eradicate the illness and and that does more than eradicate the illness doesn't it well and that's what where I was just speaking to because when you're in your heart when you're coherent in your heart okay your state of your being is love you're in that frequency that will transform the consciousness you, you won't that that frequency that's coming in it it harmonizes it so you don't get hit with it Right, it, right. it comes into that field of what's you know uh, going out, and when it, it comes in, it, it it doesn't pass into you. It, it gets transformed, you know. So someone also asked here. I would extrapolate that hate can also change molecular structure. That all emotion uh, emotions impacts molecular structure. Now let me just say something to this. All right. When I'm, I'm a wilderness outfitter, and when I go out into the wilderness, I wake up and I see such beauty out there. And my heart is just 
soaring and, and, and saying, yes, 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 this is a beautiful world out here. Now, the world, we would not have any kind of structure to, or patterns in life without love. What you are seeing out there, you know what, yeah, we have some hate, we have all that stuff that we're healing right now, but there's very, there isn't as much as there is love. And love is the thread that sews the pattern of life, the patterns of life. So when I'm looking out into the world, my heartbeat, the signature sound of who I am is going out there. And I'm creating the patterns that I'm seeing in my life. So, um, for example, you know, Monsuro Omoto, he, you know, works with the healing powers of water. And he shows that he can take a polluted, toxic um, reservoir of water. And he'll take that water out of there and he'll put it under my microscope and he'll show the water structure, the mo water molecule. And it'll, it'll be a big blob. It'll be just muck. It has no structure. It has no pattern to it. But then he adds the frequency of love and compassion or beautiful music at a higher frequency. And that same water gets transformed and he'll freeze it and put it back under the microscope and guess what he sees? A beautiful pattern snowflake that is constantly moving and creating a geometric pattern that's gorgeous because its structure, its molecule was changed and transformed by the higher frequency of love. So we are all creating this beautiful world together. What we are experiencing in our hearts, we are creating the patterns that are within our lives. You are. We are together. So I wanted to speak to that. And we're getting down to our last few minutes, 722. 22 is my favorite number. And with that, I'm going to share with you this last story about the heart solves murder. A murder mystery and a cold case. Yes. And actually, let's see here. I'm going to pull this up. Okay. All right. The following experiment, under the directions of a United States Army Intelligence and Security Command, INSCOM, is phenomenal and demonstrates that our cells even outside our body, will still respond to our emotions. In 1993, scientists conducted an experiment with white blood cells, leukocytes, that were scraped from the mouth of a volunteer. And they were separated and placed in a test tube. Next, a probe from a recording polygraph, or a lie or a motion detector, was then inserted into the tube. The donor was separated from his donated cheek cells and placed in another room where they were shown a video with scenes of fighting and killing. The probe from the polygraph detected extreme um, ex um, excitations in the mouth cells even through the donor, even though the donor was in the room down the hall. Now, further experiments were carried out with the donor and cells separated up to 50 miles from each other and up to two days after the donation, yet the results were the same. The donated cells remain energetically and non-locally connected with the donor and seem to remember where they came from. Now, earlier you said, I said this still, you know, how they respond to emotions and their cells is what we're talking about here. So doctors are now documenting stories of organ transplant patients who acquired the consciousness of the donor. So there is an unforgettable story of an eight-year-old girl who received the heart of a ten-year-old girl who had been murdered. The heart recipient had such vivid dreams of the murder that she was able to describe the murderer to the police. The murder Scene, details were so accurate that the police were able to convict the man based solely on the testimony of the young girl. Amazing. Amazing. 
The heart <laughs> connection to that organ that was transplanted stayed alive with the memory of its original owner <laughs> that implant that was received by the recipient in in totality so much so that they could see vividly what had transpired that's amazing but you know it speaks to all that we've been talking about as far as bringing health and healing to a world that where pain is running rampant where obesity you know the United States is I think the, the statistics now is 63 percent of all US citizens are considered obese they've just decided that obesity is a disease treatable under insurance and not just from a psychological standpoint but from a physical standpoint because of all of the physical issues that obesity contributes to and you know what would happen if we just were able to elevate the consciousness of the heart and heart monics and heart math and the smart heart so that people could understand that once again drop the oxygen mask and put it on yourself first look at your own heart let's heal your heart so that we can help heal other hearts and this has just been very enlightening for our first web TV show of the season of the year of its existence mm -hmm. and you bring so much to this Cynthia thank you for sharing your wisdom your knowledge and your heart with this community it's just beautiful well thank you Lynn I'm so glad that you're here to join me and I just want to say to everybody um, you know we come into this this day where also I'm learning new technology. Um, I could have um, maybe stressed myself out thinking I wasn't good enough for this or um, the technology isn't working and maybe I shouldn't do this and get all stressed out and then you know you guys would have been feeling that on here. But you know what? It is what it is. I always say you don't have to force what is meant to be. That keeps my heart coherent. You know this is what about you know in business when you're doing business you know, and and uh, you wanting to attract the perfect client to you. You know, if you're in a place of not believing in what you're, how you're serving, or um, putting yourself down, or criticizing yourself, you're going to attract people who are going to kind of point the finger at you. Also, you're not going to be getting your ideal client. What's in your heart is really, really important. It's what you are putting out to the world, and it's what you're going to get back to from the world. Okay, and the thing is, is when you were talking about you know people who are obese and have um, weight issues and things like that, all that has to do with um, ourselves, with who we are. It all stems from the heart. You know, when we're in, we've been taught from birth to be in a fear, lack, and disaster consciousness. We're changing that consciousness, and I totally believe that um, you um, do not have. Um, I just got a little sidetracked here. Uh, my sister just came in and she was turning on and off the lights. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, we we through that the lack and disaster consciousness. What happens is uh, we create that discordance within us. You know, our hearts already begin in discordance. And uh, really, I the reason why I started the Center for Loving Consciousness is to start teaching love from the very beginning. Because I'll tell you what, if we actually taught what love really is, instead of having us guess at what it is, you know, I would have never been abused, sexually abused and raped when I was a kid. We wouldn't have war. We wouldn't have any of this. And it's so important that we learn about the hearts and go to our hearts. Because also in the intention experiments, if you've ever heard of the intention experiments, when you talk about changing collective consciousness, we can go, you know, we have peace conferences and things like that. But it's about being in the correct place of being in our hearts. And so what I love is Einstein said we cannot resolve a problem at the level of consciousness in which it was created. 
and there's a lot of causes out there that are on the level in which they were created. You know, you're hating something, you're fighting against something. And Mother Teresa said, you know, if you're going to have an anti-war uh, rally, I won't be there. But if you're having a peace rally, you can count me in. So we really got to think about, you know, the consciousness of our language, the words that we're using, how we're speaking about ourselves. We have it's so important that uh, even the words that we use carries a frequency. The I am, what you say about yourself, the I am, really is the collective consciousness, the oneness of all of who we are. Your heart is 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 what is coherent with the collective consciousness. So what you're feeling, you're putting out there. And you're affecting not only yourself, but everyone. So the state of your being, let it be love. And take a nice deep breath into your heart and love yourself more today than you did yesterday. So thank you so much for coming in. And um, I've learned from, we have Virginia Parsons on here who has the inspirational um, Business Women's Show, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she is helping teach us about these hangouts. She's also the hangout mentor, so she's put a few little um, information in here for us to learn more of how we can serve you even better next time. So always, you know, check out Virginia Parsons also, and then Lynn. She does a show. Um, uh, let me see, I'll have her tell you about it and the permission movement, and then we'll be signing off. So again, I hope you guys really enjoyed these mysteries. We're going to be posting a lot of the stuff that I saw in the Q&A that doesn't go out to the public, so we'll also post it in um, the comment session, section so we can have some of this information. And thank you so much for joining us. And Lynn, I'm going to let you finish up here. Well, thank you, Cynthia. I do. I have the Biz Info Zone show that focuses on bringing news, information, and the experts to the savvy social entrepreneur. So, who's a, who's a social entrepreneur? What is social entrepreneurship? And that is you, the entrepreneur desiring to do bigger business so that you can do more good in the world. And that is what the women business owners who are co-authors in a book called Permission to be Powerful have done with the Permission Movement experience. And we're going to post the links in the comments so that you can find it. For the sake of the video, please go check out permissionmovement.org. Find out what the movement is all about. Find out why Cynthia and I are involved in a project that is going to help serve women and girls who are looking for the skills to make better choices in their lives, to live higher lives and better lives, and be higher contributors to society. So once again, thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you next week, same place, same time when our guest is going to be Matt Perlstein, the EQ dude. I love that. Makes you just want to go fist bump. <laughs> uh, yeah. so thank you for joining us, everyone. Virginia, you rock. Thanks for those wonderful suggestions. Thanks for those, everybody, who put questions in the Q&A, Ron Harvey, Jason Hodge. You guys are amazing. We so appreciate and love you, and we look forward to seeing every one of you next week. And those of you on the recording, we're talking to you, too. We'll see you next week. Yeah, here every Thursday um, on uh, at 8 o'clock Eastern. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific time, and you know the other stuff in between. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And as we go on in the show, we'll tell you a little bit more about some of the, the questions that we brought up for ourselves and the choices we made to have this show on Thursday evening at this time. So once again, see you next week when we have our special guest. Bye for now. Bye. Love to you. <laughs>